Thank you, Dr. White. Now, there'll be uh, another tape change uh, for several minutes. Then there's going to be a Q&A session for approximately 30 minutes. And if there are any more uh, questions and answers on, in a written form, please bring them up. I've got two piles here for two different speakers. Please address the question to the speaker and not leave it uh, open like that. At the end of the 30 minute Q&A session, each speaker will have a five minute... You can take it and give it to us. ...summing up. So now there'll be a short transmission. He stood on the Mount of Transfiguration. He heard the Father speak. He was with the Son. He was now filled by the Holy Spirit. He was an experiential Trinitarian, and therefore his language, Paul's language, the other disciples' language, uh, recognizes this when they speak of Father, Son, and Spirit in the way that they do, demonstrating the deity of the Spirit. Uh, Dr. James White obviously didn't address the question. Why, where is the passage in the Bible which tells us the Holy Spirit is God? I'll give you the passage which the Christians generally use. I'll help Dr. James White. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Because three persons are mentioned in this verse, the Christians assume the Holy Spirit is also God. Now, there is another trinity 
or Trinitarian formula in the Bible, Luke 9, 26. If that is the case, if you substantiate, if you, if you, if you forward this passage to substantiate the divinity of Holy Spirit, then there are other divinities. For whosoever shall be shamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. Angels are also God. 1 Timothy 5.21 I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Uh, next question is for Adnan again. Um, how did Jesus speak in the Quran, seeing it was written several centuries after the Bible? Whose witness or eyewitness account is this? Two minutes for that. How did Jesus speak in the Quran? Because Jesus was, was quoted as speaking in the Quran, seeing the Quran was written several centuries after the New Testament, the Bible. The question then, question then asks, whose witness or eyewitness account is this? Okay, Two minutes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, question is, uh, the question asked, how did Jesus speak in the Quran is simple, it's a revelation from God. God is telling us what Jesus said. Jesus said, O people of Israel, worship one God, my God and your God. So Quran is simply telling us that Jesus said that in the past. In 33 CE, when he disappeared or just before that, in his ministry, these are the words he uttered. And we believe as Muslims, the Quran is the word of God based upon solid evidence. Uh, we have other reasons to believe. Um, the Quran is definitely the word of God because of historical accuracy. Uh, prophecies are fulfilled. So for this reason, whatever the Quran tells us, we believe it to be true. And Quran is simply telling us that Jesus spoke. And he said this, and the Quran also tells us that in future, on the day of judgment, Allah will ask Jesus, God Almighty will ask Jesus, did you tell these people or your tribe or your nation to take me and my mother as gods or deities or to be worshipped beside or instead of Allah? So I say again, the word Trinity is not mentioned in this verse. <coughs> Dr. James White, you worship Jesus as God. You wouldn't deny that. Catholics worship Mary as a divine person. And the Council of Chalcedon in 451, uh, Mary was given the title of Theotokos. I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but you did write an article on your uh, website on the definition of Chalcedon. If you accept some part of Chalcedon and reject the other, why would you like to address that? Yes. Very, very quickly, uh, the Roman Catholic Church does not worship Mary as a deity. Uh, my criticism of the Roman Catholic Church has been the fact that they differentiate between Lateran and Julian. I do not believe that is a biblical definition uh, distinction. Uh, in answer to the question, there are only 25 ayah in the Quran uh, that mention the name Isa. Uh, it has been well said uh, by a liberal Muslim that the Jesus of the Quran is an argument, not a person. Only once does the Jesus of God speak in an identifiable historical context that is from the cradle. That was borrowed from a 2nd century proto-Gnostic gospel. Uh, there simply is no historical foundation. Interesting, that proto-Gnostic gospel actually had Jesus saying, I am the Son of God. But there simply is no historical foundation to the words that are placed in Jesus' mouth by the Quran. There is no evidence uh, that goes between 600 and the time of Christ that he ever said those words. You simply have to believe them. Well, because we begin with the belief in the God. This question is addressed to Dr. White again. In Surah 5, uh, verse 72, Jesus says, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. Jesus uses similar words in the Bible in John 20, 17. I go to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. And the question is, does God, Jesus in brackets, have a God? Two minutes. John chapter 1 verse 14 says that the Word, which had been described in the preceding verses, as eternal and the creator of all things, became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. 
Let me please ask my Muslim friends to think for just a moment. If you do not just start with the rejection of the idea of the incarnation, if you don't just start saying, no, Allah cannot enter his own creation. Why? That's a question only you can answer. If you don't start with that, let me ask you a question. If Allah entered into his own creation, would he be an atheist? Would the incarnate one be an atheist? Or would he not be the perfect human being? And what would the perfect human being like? What would he be like? Would he acknowledge the Father? It's not the Father who became incarnate. It's not the Spirit who became incarnate. It's the Son. Would, would he not pray? There's been perfect communion between the Father and the Son throughout eternity. Would that just stop? Would he not worship? Obviously, if the second person of the triune Godhead entered into human flesh, he is going to be the perfect worshiper. He is going to acknowledge the Father. He is going to be the monotheist. He is going to pray. He is going to be all the things that we should be because he also becomes our example. So yes, Jesus is the God-man. To this day, he continues to be the God-man. He didn't just get rid of his body someplace. His resurrection is the great hope that we as believers have that we will be resurrected. And that's a true resurrection. And so he is the God-man. And as such, as the God-man, he worshipped God. He acknowledged the Father. No question about that. We still have to deal with the fact that he and his followers identify him as Yahweh. That is the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, the question has already been uh, addressed extensively that Jesus does have a God and he clearly says to us, uh, I don't know why the Christians to this day deny this because they really want to make Jesus a God but Jesus had a God. He was not a God, he had a God. And the verses are very clear, John 17, 1 to 3, where he clearly says, the Father is the only true God. In John 4, 21, he states that the Jews are of the salvation, or the salvation is of the Jews because they worship the Father in spirit. That is the reason for their salvation. Jesus gave the clear reason. So what more do you need? In John 8, 54, Jesus said that the Father is the law of God of the Jews. And in 12, 29, a scribe comes to him asking about the commandment. Sorry, my time is over. <laughs> Next question is for Adnan again. The Mutazalites were declared heretical for believing that the Quran is not eternal, but the Quran itself claims to be eternal, since it is understood as eternal tablets. Aren't you committing shirk by believing in two eternal entities, Allah and the Quran, or eternal tablets? That is a very good question. Um, whoever asked this question. Um, the, the question is, the Mu'tazalas believe the Quran is a creation, Mahluk. Uh, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, Mu'tazalas were wrong. Because the Islamic doctrine of Quran is the Quran is the word of God. So was Jesus. What does Quran mean by this? In chapter 2, verse number 116, Allah says, when Allah wants something to be, He says, Kun fayakun. He says, be, and it is. Likewise, in chapter 3, verse 59, God says, God Almighty in the Quran, He says, the similitude of Jesus is like that of Adam. When He wanted Him to be, He said, be, and Jesus was. So Jesus was a word of God in this sense, and Quran is the word of God in, the God in this sense. The Quran existed uh, with God, not as a separate uh, um, entity, but the Quran is the knowledge of God. So we believe God was not ignorant at one time and He gained knowledge later on. God was knowledgeable from the day He existed, existed and God is eternal. So it's His knowledge. So Quran is the knowledge of God. And uh, the, the Musaf, the book we have, Quran, is the manifestation of that knowledge. So we're simply saying that God, God's knowledge is eternal with Him. God is not ignorant at one time and He becomes learned the other. So that is the point, and that's why Mokhtas were wrong. Thank you. 
Well, just very briefly, if I may comment on the related subject, uh, the idea that the Quran is eternal strikes me as somewhat difficult. And the reason is not because of the internal discussions that you might have within Islam. But as I read the Quran, as an outsider, I encounter much in the Quran that seems to be very much connected to changing vicissitudes in the life of Muhammad. Uh, the situation, for example, where he sees uh, Zainab and uh, the divorce issue, and then because of that divorce, in essence, the destruction of adoption uh, in Islamic law, strikes me that that uh, seems to be a difficult thing to understand in light of the idea that this Quran actually is a, exists in an eternal sense. Uh, from an outsider, I think that's something that to possibly uh, the Muslims might want to address a little bit more as they seek to present their understanding. There's a question for Dr. White, a slightly more academic question. My question is about henotheism. In Judges 11 and 24, we read that Yahweh gave some land to the Israelites, but the same verse also says that another God Shemosh gave some other lands to the Ammonite people. <coughs> Since the Bible clearly declares that there is only one God, how could Shemosh even exist to give <coughs> lands to his worshippers? <coughs> Judges chapter 11, verse 24. Will you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess, and all that the Lord, our God, has dispossessed before us, we will possess? Obviously, this is in, in making reference to the pagan gods around the nation of Israel. And the Bible recognizes the existence of pagan gods, not that they have a real existence. Psalm 96.5 says, all the gods and the peoples are idols, but Yahweh made the heavens. Uh, the constant uh, danger to the people of Israel was to engage in uh, Kenotheism, the acknowledgement of one primary God, the acknowledgement of lesser gods, and idolatry. We know that God brought judgment against the people of Israel over and over and over again for doing exactly that, uh, for mixing the worship of Yahweh uh, with the worship of these other gods. We need to realize that. Uh, and I think the Muslims understand this. The Jewish claim in the Old Testament was a radical thing. The people around whom they lived believed in, in essence, local deities. Well, our God makes our crops grow, and your God can make your crops grow. Our God basically is only worried about this particular valley. Uh, and that was the viewpoint of people in that day. The Jews were seen as, as hateful individuals because they came along and said, no, our God is the only God. In fact, your God doesn't exist. And people didn't appreciate that. That was not really politically correct then. Same thing that the Christians did uh, in saying to the very religious Romans and Greeks, uh, you may have all your gods, but they don't exist. Only our God exists, and we will not worship Caesar as Lord. We will not say, we will not offer a pinch of incense and say, Kaiser Kurios, we will only say, Jesus Kurios, Jesus is Lord. And so while, while that emphasis upon monotheism is there, even the Apostle Paul says there are many so-called gods and lords out there, but for us there is but one God, and he describes that one God in the Corinthians. And so, uh, uh, yeah, that's very unfortunate. Thank you, Paul. Um, that is not the only problem. The passage in Judges is not the only problem. There are other passages where there are other gods. And this is a problem for the Christian and the Jews. Um, they have to solve this problem. As the Bible stands, uh, the Bible as it stands today, we do not believe it to be the word of God. We believe there are passages which are inspired by God, but there are other passages which are not from God. Uh, for example, Exodus 7, Moses is called Elohim. 1 Samuel um, 5 7, Dagon, a pagan god, is called Elohim. Judges 11 24, the god of Amorites, Kemosh, is called Elohim. Messiah is called Elohim in Psalms 45 6. Thank you very much. Question for Adnan. What does the Holy Quran mean when it says that Jesus was the word of God, the Kalam of Allah, and the Spirit coming out of him? Okay. Another question for Adnan. You started your talk by saying that Jesus is a slave of God. Um, 
then you also mentioned that Jesus is a messenger. Can you clarify this? Jesus is not only a slave of God in Islam, Jesus is also a slave or a servant of God in the Bible too. Acts 3.13, the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus. That is the book of Acts. And then book of Acts again 4.27 calls Jesus a servant of God. So one, to be a slave of God, a servant of God, doesn't actually take... Um, the privilege away from him of being a prophet or a messenger at the same time. Every single preacher, every single man, every single human is a servant of God, willingly or unwillingly. We are serving the system of God somehow. So Jesus was a servant of God and he was privileged to be a messenger of God at the same time. That is the answer. Thank you very much. Jesus is indeed the servant of God, he's called the suffering servant, he is high priest, he's king, there are many titles that are used of him. But interestingly enough, may I ask my Muslim friends, can a mere prophet have servants, those who serve him in the religious sense? Jesus says he has servants when he stands before Pilate. He points out that if he were but to, uh, if, he, if his kingdom was of this world, his servants would be fighting for him. He could call a whole legion of angels. Those legions of angels serve him. He's called the Son of Man who comes upon the clouds of heaven. And that Son of Man likewise has those who worship him as servants. I am the servant of Jesus Christ by his grace and only by his grace. Were it not for his grace changing my heart, I would not bow the knee before him. But I am thankful to be his servant and his slave uh, because he has redeemed me. Question for Dr. White. Please comment on the Unitarian Christians at the earlier stage of Christian history and who called them heretics and who gave them authority to call them heretics? That's three questions. Well, if you're looking for the authority, it's called this. Uh, as I said from the beginning, I am a biblical Trinitarian. I am forced to believe the doctrine of the Trinity by a revelation of three foundational truths, biblical monotheism, the existence of three divine persons, and the equality of those persons. And when you start looking at any Unitarian group, and there's all sorts of different forms of Unitarianism, are you talking about dynamic monarchianism, that form of Unitarianism, uh, that, that confuses the Father and the Son and turns Jesus into a ventriloquist? Uh, are you talking about uh, an Arian form of Unitarianism? Uh, that denies the clear usage of the terms of deity of Jesus. Which, which one is it? If you look at whatever group, you will discover that they will have to reject some portion of Scripture to come up with their beliefs. Some do it openly. Uh, Mormons, for example, uh, they're not really Unitarians, they're polytheists, but they reject uh, the accuracy of the, the translation of the Bible and put the Book of Mormon above that. The Jehovah's Witnesses who wake you up on a Saturday morning uh, and you try to talk to them and you don't look very good and uh, you're all fuzzy green. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do that by using a false translation of the Bible called the New World Translation, which is purposefully mistranslated uh, to substantiate their perspectives, etc., etc. So they do it in different ways. But when you ask the question by what authority, there can only be one authority for a biblical Christian. And that is the consistent testimony of that which is theophanistos, that which is God read as the Apostle Paul describes Scripture in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's that which comes from the very mouth of God. And that's what we believe that the Old and New Testament is. And it gives a consistent testimony to the deity of Christ and to the deity of the Holy Spirit. And so those who deny those things, by what authority do you do so? By the authority of that which comes from God, the inspired scriptures. Thank you. Uh, I think to call those Christians Unitarian would be unfair on them. Because the divide of Unitarian, Binitarian, Trinitarian was actually carved by the Catholic Church in later years. So this term didn't exist as far as they were concerned. Abionites is a group. Um, which is mentioned by Eusebius in his church history, who believe that Christ is a messenger of God, he is a man born, um, born uh, miraculously, he had a virtue, and uh, Paul, Apostle Paul, is an apostate from law. And these Jews who were Christians, they believed 
in one court and they uh, followed the law of Moses, the Jewish law, um, and um, they, they were against any idea of God existing, uh, of being of God uh, with three persons in it. Uh, they were simply believing in one God and it is unfair to call them Unitarian. They just believed in one God. That's how it was. Thank you. two questions, we're actually running out of time. Uh, this question um, might be thought to be a little offensive by some Muslims, so I, I bear your patience, and uh, uh, I, I think it would be a good idea if Adnan uh, addressed it as well, to clear up some misunderstandings. That's why I'm uh, reading out to you now. Is there any form of salvation in Islam apart from joining Jihad? I doubt this, as Jesus strapped himself to the cross, so Muslims don't have to strap a bomb because he loves you. <laughs> so this question is uh, not based upon uh, topic today, but I like um, I will address it. Uh, there are other ways of attaining salvation in Islam uh, except jihad. Jihad is one of the best ways of attaining salvation, and jihad is not suicide bombing. Jihad is fighting in the cause of Allah to suppress the oppressors, to get rid of the oppressors, to fight against the oppressors, Dalimin, or all those people who are um, against peace and mischief makers. Other ways of sal salvation in Islam, praying five times a day, believing. First point is that we worship one God alone, one being one person. And the concept of Trinity was carved later, as James White himself uh, accepted the 6th century was the time when it came into being. Lane's lexicon actually describes to us the Trinity, or oh, the word ship literally means to share. And Trinity is a share of three beings. So in itself, Trinity is a share. The Quran is against the concept of sharing the divinity in one being or three beings or five beings. It doesn't really matter. Quran is talking about a principle of sharing, which is haram, which is forbidden. And those people who believe in this sharing divinity in one being or three beings are going to hell. This is what the point is. And there are many other ways to attain salvation in this world. For the third time, I have never said, never intimated, or suggested that the doctrine of Trinity developed in the 6th century. I said it was well known by the 6th century, and I've also said clearly, repeatedly, that it is a biblical doctrine, hence was believed by Ignatius in 108. Please do not misrepresent me. People are watching this, and they know how many times I have said this. I have said very, very clearly. The doctrine of the Trinity is not something that developed way down the road. It was believed from the beginning. It is a biblical revelation. And so all that assertion was, was an error. Secondly, Jesus Christ gives himself on the cross of Calvary as the only way of salvation because God is truly holy. And I don't care how many times you pray. The prophet said long before Muhammad and long before the New Testament, all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags before him. When you see God for who He is, you will see that we need a true Savior. Thank you. Well, as time is pressing, that will conclude the Q&A. We now have the uh, five-minute conclusion to each speaker. I invite Adnan to give his five-minute conclusion first, and then Dr. White. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear to me that the topic was not addressed by Dr. James White today. I have substantiated beyond any element of doubt that Trinity is definitely shaped according to the Quran, according to the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is Trinity? How the Trinity became um, a concept which constitutes shape in the first place? When we ascribe partners to God the Father, other partners, Jesus and Holy Spirit, were carved later on to be partners of God the Father, which came to be known generally, as Dr. White says, in 6th century. So those Christians who are living in those 6th centuries are doomed to hell. Because they don't have a concept, a clear concept of God, and God, God Almighty in the book of Mark, chapter 12, 29, is saying that love thy God with all thy heart, all thy 
that soul and mind. How do you love a God when you don't even understand Him? Six centuries of God, Trinity is not understood. And in the article, Dr. James White stated himself, quoting someone else, that doctrine of Trinity is a mystery. How do you understand a mystery? How do you love a mystery? If you don't understand it, how do you love something you don't understand? Dr. James White accused me of uh, misquoting uh, J. M. D. Kelly. Dr. James White, here in the article, definition of Chalcedon, he states, while noted patristic authority, J. M. D. Kelly. So it is a noted, noted patristic authority, J. M. D. Kelly, according to Dr. James White. So he said Constantine did not add anything. This is what J. M. D. Kelly has to say about. The, the clause which was added by Constantine. We know that these phrases, the later wrote his insertion to Constantine's, Constantine's expressed wish. <coughs> Page number 233, the early Christian doctrine, J. M. D. Kelly. I did not bring to misrepresent him in any way. So, this is what Dr. J. M. D. J. M. D. Kelly has to say that Constantine added, inserted a passage within the Creed of Nicaea which these Christians follow today. A pagan emperor. Thank you very much. Now, how did the Trinity come about in the first place, ladies and gentlemen? The reason we believe Trinity is ship, one of the reasons why we believe Trinity is ship is because it's man-made. People, philosophers in the 2nd, 3rd and 4th century argued again and again to insert ideas from themselves. Origin, a known early church father in the 3rd century, he writes in his book, One First Principles, On First Principles, and I quote, the apostles related that the Holy Spirit was associated in honor and dignity with the Father and the Son. But in his case, it is not clearly distinguished whether he is to be regarded as generator or ingenerator, or also as a son of God or not. For these are points which have to be inquired into our sacred, uh, um, into our sacred scripture according to the best of our ability and which demand careful investigation, careful investigation to carve a doctrine about Holy Spirit from the scriptures. Third century, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the first apostate, apostolic century. This is the third century origin speaking. Now, James White, again, he, he denied that Christianity or the doctrine of Trinity ever was ever forced down people's throat. Now, this will sum the whole thing up. Theodosian court, Emperor Theodosius, came to power in the late fourth century. And he carved laws to enforce the doctrine of Trinity on other people. Doctrine of Trinity, Trinity was finalized in year 381 when Holy Spirit was added as another third God or another third person. I'm sorry, Dr. White, uh, within the Trinity. So, chapter, book number 16, chapter 1, article number 2, Theodosian Court. Emperors, Gratian, Valentinian, and Theodosius Augustus. And leading to the people of Constantinople, it is our will that all the people who are ruled by the administration of our clemency shall practice the religion that the divine Peter and the apostle transmitted to the Romans, as the religion that he introduced makes clear even unto this day. It is evident that this is, this is the religion that is followed by the Pontic Demesis and by Peter Victor of Alexandria, a man of apostolic sanctity, that is according to the apostolic discipline and the evangelical doctrine. We shall believe in the single deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit under the concept of equal majesty and of the Holy Trinity. We command that those persons who follow this rule shall embrace the name of Catholic Christians. The rest, however, whom we adjudge demented and insane shall sustain the infamy of heretical dogmas. Their meeting place shall not receive the name of churches, and they shall be smitten first by divine, divine vengeance and second by the retribution of our own initiative. Retribution of our own initiative. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was the end of my speech, and I hope I've uh, made everything clear to you today uh, whether the doctrine of Trinity constitutes shed or not. I would like to begin my brief concluding statement by thanking you for being here this evening, for being a very respectful audience. I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, and I'd like to uh, also give uh, uh, some gifts to Adnan. Uh, it would have helped him a lot if I had given this to him before. This is my book on the Trinity. <laughs> this is another book, uh, Dan Wallace and others called Reinventing Jesus. This one especially debunks the common claim that there are parallels to Jesus and Osiris and Mithras and things like that. Good scholarly material. Thank you. 
once again, I do thank you for being here this evening and for engaging in this important subject, just very, very briefly. Uh, I cannot force Adnan to hear me say uh, that uh, Christians were Trinitarians from the start and that there was nothing about the 6th century other than simply saying that it was known at the time of Muhammad. There was no reason for him to be ignorant of it. Uh, I never said anything about the people in the intervening centuries going to hell because they didn't know the Trinity because I've never said that. Uh, but you know that, and I hope that that will come to understand that as well. Uh, if you read the rest of J.N.D. Kelly, and I've taught church history, I've written on the Council of Nicaea. If you read the rest of J.N.D. Kelly, he's talking about the discussion of where the term homoousius came from. He was talking about the people at the Council that presented it, the difference between homoousius, homoousius, and heterousius. There's much more of the context that he just seemingly does not understand the historical context of the Council of Nicaea that's very common. Uh, and I'm saying that he's misread him, not misquoted him. Those are two different things. Uh, finally, there is the assertion of Theodosius, who is the one that makes the Christian religion the religion of the Roman Empire. Once again, the doctrine of the Trinity had been known in the Eve of worship uh, for many centuries before Theodosius did that. I don't remember ever saying anything about the issue of the Roman uh, Catholic uh, Church and when it began, or Rome, or any of the rest of those things. So I don't think any of that was really relevant to what I was saying whatsoever. What I have said this evening, and uh, Adnan is very quick to proclaim himself the, the winner, uh, I leave that to you, is the doctrine of the Trinity accurately defined in the pages of the Quran? I have presented the doctrine of the Trinity to you. You don't even have to believe it. You can still understand it. He just raised the, the, the word mystery. Where did I ever use it? Where did I ever say it? He ascribed it to me. I never said it. Now, I understand the use of the word mystery because the very fact that God is eternal is a mystery to us because we cannot fully comprehend that. Our minds can't get wrapped around timeless existence. So I've got no, no problem with the word mystery, but I've never hidden behind it. I've given you a definition. I've given you the biblical basis behind it. And I've demonstrated that even though Adam continues to just quote John 8.54, he forgets 858. It just doesn't deal with the context. Deals with Quotes John 17, 1 to 3, forgets John 17, 5. Just doesn't deal with the context. I don't do that with the Quran. Why? In the debates we're doing this week, I'm looking for a consistent Muslim who will use the same standards in examining the New Testament he does the Quran and vice versa. That's what I'm looking for. Because you cannot define the word truth without using the word consistency. And so I have asked a question this evening. Where is the Quran? Identify the doctrines of the Trinity as sure. We've seen the Quran talks about three gods. We don't believe in three gods. It says, well, use the word three. Yeah, well, that can mean anything. We talk about one God. I submit to you, Adnan has just simply repeated himself. He has not engaged the criticism of his position and as such has not been able to substantiate the burden that is his in going first in this debate. But my most important word is to you. If what I said to you tonight is true, if Jesus is the one by whom all things created, if he is your creator, you cannot be neutral about him. If every breath you take comes from his hand, you cannot be neutral about him. What if what those sacred writings said is true? Those sacred writings that existed long before the Quran ever came into existence. What if it's true? What if Jesus Christ is the creator of all things? What if it is not to divide your worship, but to recognize that your Creator has entered into creation to bring about redemption for His people? And He's glorifying Himself in so doing, generation after generation, in causing men and women, boys and girls, to bow the knee in faith to Jesus Christ, all the glory of God the Father. Think about that. That is the Christian message. Um, just a uh, few quick points. Uh, I've had you be given questionnaires. Uh, they can be uh, deposited in some collection points towards the exit. And also, we can ask to talk about donations to the funding of this evening's event. They likewise can be given as you go out of the church this evening. Um, just a, a very few quick notices. I understand James White is debating another Muslim, Sami Zatari, on Thursday this week at 8 p.m. in Trinity Road Chapel in Tooting in South London. And Adnan's 
again is debating on Saturday in exactly the same seat, in exactly the same church, um, with David Wood. That's this Saturday, the 15th of November, at 10.30 in the morning. And that's all for me. Good night.